Hello, my name is Father Boniface. I am a Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and it's a pleasure to speak today with Father Will Winchell, priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, ordained in 2015, and he'll be sharing with us his journey of faith. Father Will, it's great to be with you. Hi, uh, great to be with you too, Father Boniface. Let's uh, turn to Our Lady for a moment and just entrust our time to her, to her intercession, and entrust our listeners to her as well, that they can hear what the Lord wants them to hear as we also say what the Lord wants us to say. Hail Hail Mary, Mary, full full of grace, the the Lord is with thee. Blessed Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit fruit of of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray pray for us us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, Father Will, can you tell us a a little bit about yourself, just to give our listeners, they can't see you, of course, so Mm -hmm. to give them a little uh, picture of who you are, and then just uh, ask you to share a a little bit of your journey of faith. Sure. I grew up in Mount Oliver, which is on the south side of Pittsburgh, at uh, St. Joe's Church. And I went to St. Joe's grade school. Well, I guess a little about my family. I'm the eighth of nine children. I have uh, five sisters and three brothers. And um, seven nieces, two nephews, and a great nephew. <laughs> <laughs> and then my sister-in-law reminded me, and you got two brother-in-laws and a sister-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So uh, that's our family. Um, my parents... Uh, deep uh, faith and um, love for the church and for God and um, brought us up at uh, St. Joe's where my dad had grown up himself. They, My parents just moved out of Mount Oliver just about six weeks ago uh, where they they uh, built their home there in 1970. Wow. So after 49 years of raising their wow. family, they moved out to the Pleasant, Pleasant Hills in the farther south of Pittsburgh. <laughs> Um, but my dad's family was there since 1885 when his wow. his father moved here from Germany. And so there is Winchell's in the Mount Oliver area for over a hundred, over a hundred and some years. Beautiful. Um, so my mom wrote a little note to the Mount Oliver Municipal Board. The Winchell's send their farewells. <laughs> 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 so then in the fourth grade, I... We had a merger of four four parish schools, St. Canice, St. Henry, St. George, and St. Joe's, became uh, Bishop Leonard Regional Catholic Elementary School. Mm. And uh, so fourth grade, we merged to that school. Then I went on to Carrick High School where all my brothers and sisters went there for, we had somebody there for 17 years, one of the Winchells <laughs> at Carrick High School. Then I went to Duquesne University, graduated there with my undergraduate degree in investment management. Mm. Then a number of years I worked in finance, okay, um, investment management, financial planning for a couple of years, and then I got into uh, finance in the finance business. And finally, right before I entered the seminary, I had my own business as wow. a as a small business consultant. And I help small businesses keep their finances and do business plans and um, got them incorporated or things like that, you know. To so that was my. Well, you must have been life <laughs> good at what you did to come to the place of having your own business and. Um. Yeah. I, that was my kind of my dream uh, from college time when I got into investment management. Finally, decided on that. After I transferred degrees a couple of times, <laughs> but I hear the uh, average degree is uh, six or seven Something times. Something like that, yeah. yeah. So I was I was contributing to the average. <laughs> I was in uh, engineering and then, you know, undecided twice and <laughs> different things. Exploring. But, yeah. And you stayed in the Pittsburgh area through, throughout all of that, uh, obviously Duquesne High School, but then also in your business uh, yeah, I moved around the South Hills. Uh, I had several apartments in the South Hills of Pittsburgh after college in Brookline. People from Brookline would know the Cannon. <laughs> I live right by the Cannon. Um, 
I lived in Jefferson Hills and then South Park, finally, right before I moved to seminary. Moved around a lot, but... <laughs> You're a lifer in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my only time outside of Pittsburgh for an extended time was at Theological College, a Catholic University in D.C. Okay. In for seven. my theology studies. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your how your, how your faith developed. Going back to, you know, the second and third grade, one of my childhood heroes was... Uh, Sister Marie Claire, and um, she taught us about love and devotion for the Holy Eucharist. Mm. Um, had a dramatic impact on me when I was when I was just young, second and third grade. So I, in third grade, we could, could become an altar server, you know. So was one great priest I know that you have on your show now, Bishop Bishop Barron, reminds us often of always start with Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So one of his great mottos, you know, it was that, that was the start of the devotion and love for the Eucharist when I was, you know, just a child. Mm. And, you know, third grade became a altar server basically because my three older brothers were wanting me to do it so they didn't have to do it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the age was supposed to be, but they said, "Oh, he's he's old enough." <laughs> <laughs> and my and my uncle, two of my uncles were religious priests. Uh, one was a Capuchin, oh, wow. and one was a Tor. And oh, wow. uh, Father George was a Tor, my dad's brother, and he would come stay with us on his retreat time or time off or family time uh, with us, and he would take the masses at the at St. Joe's. Mm. So we would go up and serve for him on the morning daily masses yeah. in the summertime and things. And so I had this just great love for the Eucharist, you know, from that early age, especially the um, Holy Thursday, Mass of the Lord's Supper. Mm. That was like the highlight of my, my year. Beautiful. Growing up was just the um, the whole the whole liturgy and the just the magnificence of the whole liturgy and watching that and serving and being able to hand the towel to the priest as mm. he was washing the feet and and uh the stripping of the altar was like mm. the the pinnacle of the of the altar server's life <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought at least you know it was like just to be to prepare for the good friday uh -huh. liturgy and things and be a part of that so that just that love and devotion of the of the Eucharist instituted at the the Last Supper, and remembering that just was very impactful for me mm. as a child. Then I said my my third grade teacher, Sister Marie Claire, she was actually my first grade teacher, <laughs> and then <laughs> she got recycled. <laughs> she, got, she got moved to third grade because they needed a teacher for third grade, so uh, I had her twice, and just a um, few months ago. Sister Marie Claire passed away, mm. uh, and I had celebrated her funeral mass wow. at the mother house in, in Millville, the Franciscans of Millville. Wow. So I believe she was the last funeral mass at their mother house because they just sold that property. Oh, wow. So she was my childhood hero. Back then, I mean, she was about five foot nothing <laughs> but when i was four foot three times you're right <laughs> yeah she was she was a giant um i like to say she was a giant then and she was a giant in the spiritual life for me beautiful but i remember vividly the in the third grade she asked we we would have school mass at the at the parish and each class would have to uh part you know prepare for the mass and do the altar serving reading petitions and things so i thought oh she's going to ask me to altar serve because that's what you do you know that's my thing but she asked me to read one of the petitions <laughs> the third petition <laughs> and i remember it we had the little stool there where you would get up and go onto the um onto the stool so everybody could see you and i was still not even to the microphone <laughs> and uh I was petrified. I love to serve because you didn't have to say anything. <laughs> but I was I was petrified of public speaking. <laughs> wow. And um I mean 
like trembling. And I just remember getting up there and, you know, our, one of the students, I won't mention her name, but <laughs> she got up there, straight A student. She got up there with perfect diction and perfect, <laughs> perfect tone, you know, <laughs> bouncing off the walls perfectly back to the ears of people, <laughs> mm. you know. And uh, she read she read her petition, and I'm like, this is not getting any better for me. I'm just shaking all the more. So then I get up there to read, and I'm just trembling, and the ambo is <laughs> shaking. <laughs> so my I, my I, nothing's coming out. I could just see my brother back there ah, <laughs> looking up oh at my me. From the, <laughs> oh my gosh! He's gonna do it. agony. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my sister's there. The, <laughs> yeah, she was in the second grade oh please let him get through this (laughs) (laughs) and so my friend uh, mike black knocks me over and he takes my petition and he reads it (laughs) (laughs) i was just like oh wow so it was just sounds kind of traumatizing (laughs) (laughs) one of those things but um you know years later of when i was reflecting on things going before I went to seminary and in seminary I was reflecting back and you know I realized then and for a long time I had just was gripped by fear mm. and just lived in in fear of every everything you know speaking to people speaking in public I could have never done this <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know only by the grace of God <laughs> But, you know, I lived in this trap of fear all my, most of my life, mm. you know, not because of Sister Marie Claire, but, <laughs> but, but, um, just lived in this kind of trap of not, not being able to share my, my faith, mm. my love for the Eucharist, mm. my love for the Lord, which was deep in my heart. Not being able to share that, not being able to share the faith, not being able to share my my life, not being able to share my love to for others, you know, just ultimately just just not being able to share myself mm. with with others, mm. you know, and I just lived in this trap, you know, this enclosed uh, space of spiritual fear, mm. you know. Really paralyzed. Yeah. Imprisoned. You know, and when I would have to do things, public speaking or or this or that, it was just came out much more prevalent mm-hmm. where I would just tremble, <laughs> literally be shaking and and that sort of thing. Well, you're not shaking now. <laughs> you're doing an amazing yeah. job. Yeah. Come so, a long uh, way. So, um, yeah, I was just, um, yeah, living in that fear. So, yeah, even though I had... Uh, you know, this great love for the Eucharist and this deep devotion, I just couldn't share it. <laughs> and that was, uh, like you said, paralyzing. <laughs> and it affected most parts of my life, you know. Now, I think I'm with my parents um, and our family support and things and their love and support, you know, I came up with a healthy <laughs> upbringing. But this, this thing I kind of kept hidden from people. Mm. If they could see it or not, I'm not sure, but, you know. Only those who were at that mass when you were in third grade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, as I say, I lived in that trap of fear. And as I was reflecting in my seminary time, you know, which I think is the key point for people, you know, if I can say a, a message of something mm-hmm. to have a, you know, we need or time for reflection mm. in our life, you know, you know, that daily reflection, extended times of reflection to look into the interior life. Right. You know, and I think that's a lot of things not going on today. We're so troubled by all the busyness of life, you know, right. the constant images from our cell phones and, and distractions of the world you know, I mean, it's not anything new like St. Paul said, all the allurements of the world, you know, but it's, I think, pressing in on us more. So in that seminary time, I had a lot of the quiet, quietness time to be able to reflect. 
and one of the great practices I picked up in high school was journaling mm. and uh, probably 15, not for any spiritual thing, just from my English teacher said, you know, you should keep a journal and I could go back and journals on my, on my bookshelf wow. all the way back till I was 15 years old, you know, wow. some 20, 20 some plus years of journals, um, you know, and on and off from like different times of life. But, mm-hmm. but I think that was, it was a way for you to get things out of yourself. Mm-hmm. Look at what's happening inside. Yeah. So in that reflection time, you know, I come down, see this, you know, what had living in fear, you know, I found manifest sin, <laughs> mm. you know, whenever you're living in fear, eventually sin is going to come out of that interior space. Uh huh. And, and that's, uh, that's what happened for me. <laughs> um, my life in, in college, uh, my years immediately after college was just, uh, a life of sin and dissipation and, mm. You know, it ultimately led, though, to loneliness, Mm -hmm. a deep loneliness and a real deep um, just emptiness, Mm. you know. And the sin that was manifesting in all parts of my life, I was just completely (laughs) self-absorbed, you know. Mm. The ego ran my life, every sensual thing, um, all that, and just that whole realm of sin I was living in, <laughs> you know. Trapped in yourself, yeah. turned in on yourself. Yeah, from this life of fear, yeah. the sin just started coming out, <laughs> wow. you know. And then, just to share a little story, the that was my life, you know, just living that. But the the depths of that sin finally came to it. The deepest parts of that sinful life came to its depths at, I was assaulted mm. by six men as part of a just a innocent bystander, so to speak. But because I was in this realm of environments of sin all the time, in and out. Oh wow! Not that I was caused anything to provoke this, but it was actually in that case I was actually not. I was innocent of anything going on to provoke it or anything but uh, wrong place at the wrong time. And, and I, I got beat up pretty bad. I was hospitalized for almost two weeks. Wow. I had broken my jaw in three places. Um, I had reconstructive jaw surgery and I have three titanium plates still permanent in my, in my jaw. Wow. Um, And from time to time, whenever I (laughs) yawn or something, though, slightly move out of position and they'll <laughs> remind me of that you know and um it's a they did an amazing job looking at you i noticed yeah. just when we were getting started you have a little scar yeah if you can, but even that's so hidden yeah it's, that's uh from the surgery that's yeah that's cut, amazing and that was probably a good 15 years ago now that's amazing that that happened did an amazingly good job yeah. of reconstructing all of that yeah but that must have been a horrific experience yeah it was uh traumatizing it was um i stayed in the hospital because i couldn't eat (laughs) after the jaw surgery i wasn't able to eat and they wouldn't let me go home until i was able to to you know at least eat some some uh some things so they had me on ivs for several days and that kind of thing and um you know two couple of things happened there in the in the hospital one my you know, I was recovering. Just yeah, you know, every every day my mom and dad were there, mm. <laughs> just praying. <laughs> wow, just praying. You know, you know, and they were constant praying for my for my physical healing. You know, mm. of the surgery and all that, and the, all the other different bruises and things that they were nursing back to health, but. um you know, they were really praying, you know, for for my soul. <laughs> yeah. You know, for my, the spiritual brokenness <laughs> mm. that I had, you know, all that fear I lived with. And, mm. and you know, they were just there, individual, every day, 
about how old were you at that time? I was about uh, 25 years old. Okay. Yeah, 24, 25. I'm 39 now, so. Okay. And you really experienced their constant love <laughs> and presence. You were grateful to have them there, I presume. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah my parents, like I said, are pillars of faith. Uh-huh. Um, just um, bring bring the light and joy to the world. <laughs> And uh, blessed to have them as my parents. So even yeah. in your kind of life of sin and dissipation, it wasn't so much rebellion of, or rejection of your parents, or but just just that whole kind of inner swirl of mm-hmm. getting lost in yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only remember one time I rebelled. <laughs> um, I was eighteen, and I wanted to go to Cedar Point. <laughs> And I told my dad, I'm going to Steeter Point. We're staying there. It was a two-day trip overnight. And I said, you know, I'm 18 now. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> you know, and he gave the old, you know, there's like this handbook, I think, for like parents, <laughs> how to respond to your 18-year-old child, you know, or your teenager. Ah, you, uh, you live under my roof. <laughs> but that was my... Rebellion, but that was short lived. Uh, no, I had a lot of respect, admiration, love for my for my mom and dad. You know, was blessed to have them. So they're they're in their now in their empty nester years. <laughs> After fifty two <laughs> years of marriage, they just moved to a, a small little apartment. Wow! So they're just getting settled in there. But um, yeah. And then I had in the hospital there, I was in all this pain, you know, I was thinking about woe is me kind of attitude. And then I forget what night it was, several nights into it, I had a roommate come in for one night and young man who was shot in the face oh. in a gang fight Wow! down in, in Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, he was screaming in agony all night long, wow. you know, and then they, they moved him and he had surgery, I believe. And I never seen him again, but I thought, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, oh, my life is so horrible now. <laughs> and then I seen him come in, wow. which I think was a grace of God to see the suffering, real suffering, <laughs> Yeah, you know, of him coming in there. Um, it can always be worse. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we we think um, we got it bad, but we don't really know what suffering is. I think sometimes. Yeah. Wow. Um, so our our sufferings we carry, you know, we have to. As the Lord says, uh, "My burden is light." <laughs> yes. You know, so we carry the the burden like light. You know, it's not not heavy. <laughs> um, but. Um, also there in the hospital, my my dad, you know, of course, all my, some people wanted me to seek revenge. Mm. And people would come visit and suggest those kind of things. And my dad would be sitting there listening, you know, and just before I got out, you know, I remember him saying something like, you know, you can carry this this around and you can hold this in your heart and have a grudge and become bitter, have bitterness and for the rest of your life. And, you know, the thing is, you'll probably never see these guys ever again in your life. Mm. And, um, or you could just forgive them. Wow. And so when I left, I was on my way out of the hospital there. Um, my parents were taking me out and, um, I, I I said, I forgive them, mm. you know, just from my heart. Wow. And it, it at least opened up my self to forgiveness, Yeah. you know. And sometimes I think forgiveness is like a, a journey, not a one-time <laughs> yeah. thing. And But um, over, the year, over, over the years, I did come to the point of, of forgiving them. Wow. Yeah. So I left there and... Your dad gave you a real gift. Yeah. I'm telling you that. Yeah. So, I mean, it was certainly a grace from the Lord Yeah. Um, of forgiveness. But I left the hospital. You know, I, was, I realized that 
it was a grace from God because I had, you know, even though I was living pretty much sinful life, I still had, you know, some sense of, of God and faith. And, um, you know, I was going through the motions still <laughs> of going to Mass and things. So, you know, I recognized that grace from God, but even though I had that grace, I didn't respond to it. Mm. You know, rather, I, it deepened my fear. Mm. Now, as everywhere I went, I could hardly go in public for several months after that. I, you know, always looking over my shoulder, going, you know, I didn't go out, <laughs> didn't yeah, do anything. Understandably. Um, you know, I just lived, it deepened my life of fear. Mm. And that was kind of, you know, how I lived a couple months after, you know, but, you know, we were talking earlier about catechesis, the good shepherd. Mm. And um, the good shepherd is one of the great images of Christ that I like to reflect on. And, you know, the good shepherd <laughs> who goes after the lost sheep mm. was coming after me, <laughs> mm. you know, and um, he was searching, <laughs> mm. coming after. We think we got to go to God, but God's God's coming to us all. <laughs> yeah, you know, seeking us out. Yeah, you know, seeking us out. And um, he can't stand for us to stay lost. Yeah. So, so the good shepherd, I, so, you know, he entered into my life, or I'd like to say, rather, he, I finally recognized <laughs> the good shepherd in my life. Mm. And so I started slowly, you know, praying more often and things. And then what happened one, one day I was up at one of my uh, dear friends from college. His uh, dad has a camp up in, up, up uh, north central Pennsylvania in Potter County. And we were up there. We had gone there over the summers for several years. And this particular summer, when all after all this was going on, he had one of his friends come up with him. It was his high school buddy. And um, I didn't know him. So we were out there around the campfire. And this kid happened to be, a, if you're familiar with, a PK, a preacher's kid. Oh. <laughs> You know, he grew up with, he was, his father was a uh, a minister and a preacher. And um, so he's, he's asking me all these things around the campfire. You know, why do Catholics believe this? Why do Catholics, you know, worship Mary? You know, these kind of, uh, like all these misunderstandings yeah. that, that people have about the faith. Um, you know, and then the one that got me was, why, why do you go to confession to a priest? Huh. You know? And I, I thought to myself, I'm trying to answer all these questions he asked. I thought to myself, well, I haven't been to confession to a priest in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. And, um, you know, sad but true. But, um, you know, so I'm trying to answer them here with my second grade level catechism knowledge. It's falling a little short. Yeah, yeah. You know, like we were saying earlier, you know, I just had... had no understanding of my faith, even though at that time I was probably now 26 years old. But he really, this guy really challenged me, and it really stirred up within my heart. This, you know, I I just sat. They all went to bed after, and I I sat around that campfire like, why is this bothering me so much? Hmm. I don't, you know, I was like, yeah. Basically, I was I was just neutral. You know, lukewarm as the Lord says, you know, I wish you were hot or cold. I was just yeah. lukewarm. You know, it was just like, uh, I, why is this faith stuff, these questions bothering me so much? And it just started this path for the next several months where I just started consuming the faith, started reading the lives wow. of the saints, started going to mass uh, faithfully, you know, started going to Eucharistic adoration um, at that time, I lived in the South Hills. They had perpetual adoration at the Oratory in Oakland, mm -hmm. part of Pittsburgh. Um, I would drive across town during rush hour to spend two, three, sometimes, you know, three hours wow. in adoration. And just oh, really evenings. lit a fire in you. Yeah. And I got involved in 
Bible studies. Um, I got involved in the diocesan youth ministry as a as one of the youth leaders for the diocese. Um, I became a, I my started going to mass and you know whenever you you're twenty something years old and I started going to daily mass. You know the church ladies are like. <laughs> I think he's going to become a priest. He's going to be a priest. <laughs> it's the only so, reason the twenty-year-olds go to mass. <laughs> yes, he must be. Right. So, uh, so one day, the lady, the pastoral associate at our parish, after mass, she said, um, "Do you want to be a lector for mass on Sundays?" And because of my great fear of standing in front of people, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> It all comes full I, circle. I'm thinking in my head, no way. <laughs> and what came out was, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, so the Holy Spirit just took over and was like, here you go. So, you know, I would just consume the, the Sunday readings, just pour over them all week long to prepare, say every word, just in the right tone and, you know, trying to proclaim the the message that she this the uh, pastoral associate asked me you know I thought it's such an honor to do that things like that just started to to grow and and then finally it came to the point of um I was growing in this life of of renewed faith um you know this great grace of God that he gave, gave me and responding into it now and um you know but it was like I was still, tri- you know, with my old friends and still getting into, you know, it was like by day, life. by day, by day, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was like these worlds started to, to um, you know, push, trying one trying to push the other out uh-huh. and um, try to grow in grace and, you know, something happens and, you know, so finally somebody called me one of my I'll say friends associates <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe it's more <laughs> um, partners in crime yeah partners in crime called me up and said oh we're going to this annual party that we have went to for the last three four five years and I said no I'm not gonna go I, I got I got work tomorrow I can't do it blah 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 I gave him a hundred excuses you know he keeps Oh, dude, we'll see you there. You know, <laughs> you know, he's like, I oh, know, we'll break down and be there. <laughs> so I'm got all night um, back and forth. Oh, no. Finally, I'm like, okay, I'm driving in a car going down, going to this place. And uh, so, you know, it was this internal struggle of both sides. And so I went and don't remember much, but <laughs> mm. then, then the next morning came. Um, I had forgot to charge my cell phone battery through the night, and uh, I wake up. It's about 10 a.m. Mm. or so, a little bit after 10 a.m. I start work at 8 a.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> not um, good. No, <laughs> not good. So I plug in my phone. I'm like, oh, my dear. I'm just having this, you know, these two worlds are just colliding within me, and I'm just having this. What, you know, what do I do here? What do I do? I'm going to lose my job, Rob, you know, or whatever. I'm thinking all these things running through my head. I get my phone charged, and it it starts going, ding, 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 ding. messages coming through. Yeah, and then beep, 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 beep. You know, you got 27 new text messages. You got you got 11 new voicemails. Start listening to voicemails. Hey, well, this is your friend so and so. Uh, your your dad called me. Are you okay? Hey, this is my one buddy that was at the camp. Hey, your dad called me. You okay? What's going on? Give me a call. You know, we'll catch up. Another person called. Hey, what? Well, everything all right? Then, William, this is your father. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a call immediately. So what? You know, and along with it, work, my supervisor calling. Hey, this isn't like you. We're, we're, it's 8.15, you're late for work. Everything okay? Eight, 8.45, hey, we're worried about you. You know, nine nine fifty. hey, just give us a call, you know, if, if whatever. You know, all these messages. Then with my dad, you know, 
this is your father calling. <laughs> <laughs> Call me back. So what had happened is my dad was my emergency contact at work. <laughs> so they called me several times. Then they called him. And then he called all my friends that they had. <laughs> they had phone numbers. My mom and dad had their phone numbers of my friends. So that's, you know, all these messages. So <sighs> it was, you know, that just two worlds couldn't. And I, I said, you know, God, I'm, I'm just a mess. <laughs> I'm a mess, you know. And so, so what did I do? I called on my dad. Mm. I thought, who could I call? Mm. I'm too afraid to call work. <laughs> too embarrassed to call them. Too, too embarrassed to call my friends. I called my dad and said, Dad, I need you to. I need you to come over to my apartment, and I lived right on the other side of the bridge. And my dad said, I'm halfway there. <laughs> I'm coming over the bridge right now. Wow. <laughs> like and, a good shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> Was waiting. <laughs> you know, yeah, just like uh, the prodigal son and the father. You know, he's standing out Are there. running? Looking. <laughs> yeah. And um, so he came. He came, and I was living with two of my buddies from college at the time, and I seen him pulling up the road from from upstairs, so I ran down the steps because I didn't want them guys to see me. I didn't know what, what <laughs> was uh, going to ha occur, but I knew it wasn't going to be pretty. <laughs> so I ran down into my dad's car, and I just got in the car there, and I just wept in his arms. Mm. Just tears just poured, poured out, and... Mm. I just sat in his arms for like an hour. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I just said, Dad, Dad, I, I just don't. And my dad just with tenderness, with care, with, you know, just gentleness, just held me there. Mm. <laughs> you know, I just wept in his arms. <laughs> it'll be okay. No condemnation. It'll, it'll be okay. Just mercy. Yep. You know, and it was just, yeah, the Father's mercy through my 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 dad. <laughs> you know, the Father, Heavenly Father's mercy mm -hmm. just flooded. And I, I had those, it was just those tears of contrition, you know. Mm. Um, and I was looking, trying to look up. I had read a quote you know, a couple of years ago. I used for a homily when I was telling this story, but I think it was St. Ambrose. I believe maybe I'm some one of the saints said, you know, we have we have a baptism of water and a baptism of tears. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can be in either order. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know. That's right. But uh but that was it. I believe that was my baptism of tears and Yeah. So then, you know, then after that my face just started growing rapidly and just started continuing the adoration and started then somebody said to me Wait, we're going to we had a bible study they said we're going to mass and i was like it's eight thirty at night <laughs> where's her mass <laughs> and i was like but it's tuesday <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> i forgot all of my daily mass i was so you know, far away from from things of faith. And so I went, started going to daily mass. Somebody invited me. Just go, hey, come to daily mass with us. They had 9 p.m. mass at the oratory. Wow. Uh, back then, I don't know if they still have it, but, or a late, late, late evening mass, whatever time it was. But so I started doing that, going to mass. And then that's where the church ladies <laughs> started coming in, you know. And then one of them came up to me, said, you're going to be a priest. <laughs> and, I, and at this point, I was actually, well, I was thinking about it a little bit. No, no, no. So I denied it. But then you know, all this had happened. A couple months went by after that thing with my dad. And um, I was like, there's just something still not sitting right within me. You know, it's like I had this lump in my... <laughs> You know, my spiritual <laughs> mm. heart, you know, 
in my um and I was watching this um this broadcast on T V, this priest talking and that's why I appreciate your work, you know. Hmm. Uh you know people hear the things that you say it is, inspires people and this priest on the T V said, What you need to do what you're missing is you need to go to confession. And it was like this guy was oh, yeah. looking right at me <laughs> through the TV. I was like, that's it. And so then, you know, then the next day I was like, and I got a whole story about confession, but I don't know if we have time for all that. <laughs> but it took me, it took me about five. I said, I'm going to confession tomorrow. <laughs> you know, when this guy said that, uh, this priest said, so... About six weeks later, <laughs> I finally went to confession, and I said, um, "Bless me, Father, I've sinned. It's uh, ten years since my last confession, and I just made the best confession I could, and I got all this weight of sin off of me, oh. you know, and just this heavy burdens I was carrying around of all this fear that I lived with so long for so long. Just, just put it." put it out there you know we speak we speak those words of sin they they no longer have power over us mm. you know give them to the lord in confession you know just give just go to confession so if i could say something to anybody listening would be if you haven't been go go to confession you what know. you need is confession <laughs> right so right maybe now I'm, you're the priest you're I'm, saying it <laughs> yeah. what a, what a blessing it was and then and then almost immediately after that, God placed on my heart the, you know, the call to priesthood. Wow! Within days or weeks after that, I went on a retreat uh, the next weekend. After that, and just started hearing this this gentle call of God. Now that all that weight of sin was gone, you could hear, and the clear conscience was there. Yeah, you could. I could finally hear God mm. speaking. You know, in that gentle voice um yeah it was um you know i one of the great um passages of scripture there that i was meditating on a lot at that time was isaiah 55 all you who are thirsty come to the water mm. come and receive mm. you know you tried to receive Quench that thirst in a lot of other places. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Yeah, all the enticements and lures of the world. You know, is um, you know, it says um, power, pleasure, <laughs> um, pride. You know, all the mm -hmm. allurements of the world, fame and fortune. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, try to fill up with all those things, but they all left me. Completely empty, which I think is a good spiritual place for God. <laughs> That's right. You know, that kenosis of, of life to empty oneself like the Lord did, to mm. humble himself and become become one of us. Mm. You know, that great act of humility. So then, then I went back to that first love <laughs> mm. of the Holy Eucharist, you know, and after that, that good confession went back to receive the Holy Eucharist, you know, in a new new way, and a new, like, renewed love of, of the Lord and the Eucharist. And your so, fear must have started dissipating. Yeah, it um, it kind of vanished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. When, it, you, when you started lecturing, how did that go? Oh, it was... Um, it was uh, a little nerve wracking. What what I got out of it was I prepared so much <laughs> for that four minutes, you know, three, four, or five minutes that you just talk. I would spend hours, six, seven hours reading over the pad. I got to get this right, you know. Every day, every day of the week, if I was reading on Sunday, I'd I'd read over the passage thirty minutes, forty five minutes. Um, you know, spending, uh, you know, and then I'd read commentaries and things, 
you know, what what's he saying here? And then we had one of those reader's guides would say, you know, inflect here, you know, say this in a soft tone, speak, you know. Um, so I would try to, you know, really. So I think that preparation, you know, and that thing. So whenever I got in the seminary, <laughs> one of the one of the formators, he knew I I had talked to him about this. You know, I I need this extra preparation. I need to really really have the time to prepare if I'm going to speak in front of people, give a reflection at at night prayer or something and things. And and so I was probably three years into seminary, two or three years into seminary. Um, well, I guess of my second year in the. He comes up to me, and uh, we're going to this dinner, sending on some of our guys on to theology. So we were having a dinner, and uh, they were getting candidacy, I believe, uh, candidates for priesthood. And so all these seminarians coming up, to, oh, I hear you're giving the talk tonight, like as I'm walking in the door. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, didn't you hear from Father So-and-so? You're, you're, you're giving the, the speech for these guys the four guys going on <laughs> and everything. And I'm thinking, no, nobody told me, you know, so, so that, you know, and it's like, so I'm like jotting down notes and this and that, what am I going to say? And I'm, you know, we're having this little reception and people are talking to me and I'm like in the corner chatting. Oh my god! I'm like, you know, and then, so I get to the priest who, who would have been the one to, you know, make the assignments for the, for the dinner, who was going to speak and so and so and such. And um, I said, you didn't tell me, am I speaking tonight? He's like, oh, yeah, I didn't <laughs> tell you. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, as the Lord says, don't don't prepare the words you're going to say, <laughs> but I'll give them to you at the time. <laughs> so it was like, you know. Wow, you came a long way. <laughs> so then I, I gave and. Uh, you know, was put on the spot. So I think that was a, and um, one of the, one of the priest formators, you know, knew I had this anxiety still even in seminary. He said, "You may know Father Joe Freedy." Uh huh. Yeah, he said to me he was a he was a vocation director when I entered, and uh, you know, he said, "Take as many opportunities to speak in front of people as you can." In Exposure the therapy. Yeah. <laughs> So that's what I did. I took it, and I, I'm very grateful to him for for that advice. And, uh, you know, even though from time to time i got to give a homily, get a little <laughs> anxious and things, I, you know, that trap of fear is no longer there. You know, Beautiful. It's, it's unlocked. The Lord unlocked the, you know, that spiritual trap for me. <laughs> beautiful. You know. Wow, Father Will, what a beautiful journey of faith from those seeds. I love the way you highlighted the power of a religious vocation, Sister Marie Claire, and mm -hmm. leading you into a full third grade catechesis <laughs> and encounter with the Lord. And then God help us for all of the intervening years that you mm -hmm. didn't uh, advance in that understanding of the faith, but mm -hmm. that good solid foundation was there and became mm -hmm. something to build on. And then your beautiful relationship with your parents, all of their prayer mm -hmm. with you being at your side after that terrible uh, assault that you experienced and mm -hmm. their, their support for you, the constant love that they had for you so that as you then finally encountered uh, somebody who challenged your faith and, stirred a fire in you it's amazing that that <laughs> yeah that encounter with the preacher's kid uh, yeah. i started getting those questions going and stirred up that place of faith and you were ready to really explore that and seek out what this faith is really about and then to be able to grow in that and I mean, you can really see the grace of god at mm -hmm. work there that the, the little spark you allowed that to spark something and then the reading the prayer the the pursuit, the hunger, something really formed until finally your your life broke with the uh, not being able to sustain both the, the life of dissipation and the life of, of prayer and virtue at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then to have your father really be the presence of the Heavenly Father, to receive yeah. you in his yeah. arms, to hold you, to love you, to communicate that mercy to you. 
leading you ultimately to the the big confession. And then, as you said, uh, everything cleared out, and then you could hear God's voice. Right. What a, what a difference that is. Yeah. And when you have a clear conscience and experience mercy, mm-hmm. then that vocation, you're the real purpose of your life, ultimately. And nothing's lost. That's the amazing thing about God. Nothing's lost, and yet yeah. Yeah, it's, uh... you couldn't step into that full purpose until you had that confession and conversion and then just have been growing in faith and mm-hmm. and what a beautiful example from paralyzed in third grade speaking <laughs> petition number three <laughs> to yep. a radio interview <laughs> and sharing your faith with however many thousands of people yeah. will will hear this really right. beautiful witness such a beautiful witness yeah well thank you yeah well, thanks be to God. <laughs> thanks be to God. A good yeah. shepherd never gave up on you. Yeah. Continue to pursue yeah, you. He's still coming after. <laughs> still coming after us. Yep. Well, thank you so mm-hmm. much for, for your witness. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for the time to be here and to be able to share God's grace. <laughs> mm. It's the Lord, you know. It's that, you know, we want to be freed and liberated. You know, and that's that's what I feel like. I was liberated by the Lord, you know. If we just uh, confess with our hearts and with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. He came to save us and mm-hmm. set us free. Yeah. And you're a, a living testimony of that. By God's grace. By God's <laughs> grace. Yeah. Amen. Father Will, could you lead us in a in a prayer and offer a blessing as we wrap up? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you, send your Holy Spirit upon your church to, to give her freedom and peace, to liberate her from all fears, that we may live as the children of light and the children of peace the children of your kingdom. Fill all of the listeners with your grace, your peace, your blessing. Put into their lives those agents of mercy and forgiveness, those agents of healing. The people of God may bring this um, broken world into the kingdom of light and peace as we all want to be the children of your kingdom. We ask your blessing on all the listeners, on all Father Boniface, all the Benedictine monks who do such great work for your your kingdom. May all of our work bear fruit for the kingdom of heaven. We ask our prayers through the intercession of Benedict, St. Fidelis, St. Peter, Paul, Michael, Andrew, patrons of my parish, and our Blessed Mother Mary, and that you grant them through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Father Will Winchell, thank you so much for sharing your testimony of faith. You're welcome. Thank you.